Well, welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we're going to talk about the Ascension today because as we're recording this, that's what just happened, which is going to be confusing because I forgot to release the episode last week. So that's going to come out next week and it'll talk about things from a couple weeks ago and pre-recording is kind of interesting sometimes, isn't it, Kevin? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's okay. We're all locked in our houses, so time no longer matters. Right. It's all wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff to begin with. Exactly. (laughs) References that Kevin doesn't get, number one. I know what that means. (laughs) We have listeners that will get that one, though, and they'll appreciate it. So that was for them. So we just uh, had the Ascension last Thursday, which for a lot of people, this Sunday, this past Sunday, was the first Sunday they were back in church too. States yeah. have started opening up and we actually get to attend church and kind of fun, which is cool. Uh, so the, the episode that'll come out next week is actually about church and what that is. That's and right. It'll yes. still be relevant because church it's is church. always relevant. But anyways, so we were back in church this Sunday. Your church may have celebrated the Ascension on Sunday. Some churches actually have the festival on the Thursday. Other churches observe it on the following Sunday. Do any do it before Ascension actually happens, Kevin? Is that a liturgical thing? They, they really shouldn't, no. <laughs> okay. Um, you can't it, celebrate the festival before it's actually occurred? And you can't, you really shouldn't celebrate it on a Sunday. It definitely is a Thursday kind of thing here. Okay. It, we, we know how many days after Easter it happened, so we can't just pretend it didn't happen that day. <laughs> um, the, it's actually clear. So All right. it's, 40, it's 40 days after Easter, which always makes it on a Thursday. And then the confusing thing is, after Ascension, you have yet another Sunday of Easter. And that confuses everybody. Because they're ready yeah. to go right from, right from Ascension to Pentecost. But, but remember, you have 40 days after Easter. That's Ascension. And then, it, but Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. Yeah, so you have 10 another days 10 after the days. Ascension. Right. So you've got it between that Thursday and Pentecost, you've got another Sunday of Easter. I had so, fun explaining this to, to Silas as we're driving in the car, because the older kids, they've gone through it enough and they kind of remember, so they, they, they're like, okay, yeah, we get that. But explaining it to Silas, it's like, okay, Ascension is 40 days after Easter, and we actually know this date. Like, this is actually recorded in Scripture, so we're going off of the actual timeline, so that's why we do it on a Thursday, because it was like, why are we going to church on Thursday? Because our church opened up then, so we actually were able to, our first full... I can't do air quotes on the radio. You can't do it. Doesn't help. It doesn't, help. So it doesn't, doesn't work. Help. We're not on the radio either. <laughs> our, our, well, maybe one day, Kevin. Maybe one day well, we'll be syndicated on go. the radio. Um, I so doubt just it. in case, if somebody's listening to this in the future, um, but our full, full service was on Ascension, so our family was able to go and participate in that. So it's the only, well, other than Maundy Thursday, it's the only church service on a thursday so it's on a thursday kind of yeah. weird so trying to explain it to silas who's eight and here's how this works and that and oh by the way then there's pentecost and the eyes start to glaze over and after that is trinity sunday and they glaze, glaze over even further i was like but if you're on the one-year lectionary and that all bets are off then then, right. then i yeah i don't know what's going on and then on who anymore. knows what's going on with that it doesn't make sense <laughs> just really doesn't so anyways, there's there's the quick rundown of Ascension, right? There it is. Is that our well, episode? No, Are we done? That's simply the timing of it. It has nothing oh, to do with the actual okay. Ascension. So the Ascension of Jesus, everybody knows it because we talk about it in the Creed, right? So He ascended into heaven, sits at the right, right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Yep. From thence he will come. To judge the quick and the dead. That's the quick how, and the dead. That's how I learned it. That's at why a, I'm slow of foot, so I don't be a, judged. I learned it at a Catholic school in fifth grade in Nairobi, Kenya. Sorry, Standard 5. It was not fifth grade. It was Standard 5. Catholic school in Kenya. That's where I learned the apostle. No, it's actually in English, because English is one of the national languages of Kenya. I learned the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer at, in fifth grade, Standard 5, at that Catholic school. That's where I learned them. Anyways, well, there's a nice little aside. So you didn't learn the entire Lord's Prayer, you just learned the Catholic part of it. I think so, probably. Learn the extra part later. (laughs) That's really interesting. Okay, so that had nothing to do with anything, but thanks for listening. Yeah, um, I'll I'll try to stop. So the Ascension of Jesus, um, like I said, we all know about it, and that's what we're talking about. It's in the Creed, so we all have known it since we were 
kids, uh, apparently since Peter was in Africa. And, <laughs> um, but, but we don't really talk about it much. And then we have this one church service a year where we focus on it that no one comes to because it's on a Thursday night that either no one remembers or if they do remember, they don't feel like going to church on Thursday night. For some oh, reason. it was so, that Thursday? Yeah, whoops. Oh. So um, I actually vividly remember missing Ascension one year and I was very young. It wasn't my fault. Well, it was my <laughs> fault, but um, yeah. Someone actually called me and said, I can't believe you missed Ascension. And I was like, what? Oops. Yeah, so so ever since then, I know when Ascension is. But um, so we, we may or may not remember it and then we may or may not go. And then when we get there, the sermon may or may not actually explain what the ascension is. They might preach on something else. So we just thought it'd be fun to just kind of take a brief moment and not touch on everything about the ascension, obviously, because that would take the rest of our lives, but to just kind of go over why the ascension is important, um, why this is actually a pretty major event in the Christ event, and what this means for us as the church and what this means for us as individual believers, what this means for the end of the world, the future of the world, and what this means for anything else that we think of. Mm -hmm. Is that enough for one podcast? I, I think so. I mean, we're going to we're... cover the entire history of the world <laughs> and, and how it ends. The ascension. Well, from the that, ascension that forward. From, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. we're not going to do all that, but it's, but it's important. That, You've got it in Luke. It's referenced in other other places in Scripture, but like you said, Kevin, we have it in the Creed. Uh, we have it in both creeds, don't we? Nicene Creed also. Yeah, yeah. Because so I get I get the wording mixed up depending on which creed we're in. That's the place where I start stumbling because it's close but not quite. In and, the creed. and we also have it in in Acts chapter one. It's actually a little clearer. Oh yeah, in Acts, Acts one eight. One. Well, so Luke following. wrote Luke wrote both of those things. Yeah. So. Um, the Gospel of Luke ends with his, him ascending and the disciples returning to Jerusalem with great joy. But then Acts really gives us the full history. That's where we get the, you know, why are you looking up in heaven? The same Jesus that went up will come down just as he went mm -hmm. up kind of stuff. That's all in Acts. The so that, that's really appear. Yep. historically um, where we look at kind of our biblical text for the ascension. But, but it's referenced other places as far as the theological import of the ascension and what it means for Jesus now. And that's, that's kind of more important than the physiological aspects of it. Basically, and, and we were talking about this a little bit before we pressed record, actually, is that Peter said that this is why some people think heaven is up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of this is the Bible thing. verse. It's right there. He right. went it's, up uh, he went into up. heaven. Right. There so, you go. And even the word ascend, right, would mean up, yeah. going up. Yeah. So... So this is one of the this is one of the reasons that the the idea of heaven being up is there is Jesus goes up and he's going to come back down that's what they say so that's easy up and down language mm -hmm. um, but it's it's much more than just it's going like up Sesame and coming down Street now well that's kind of and there's other places <laughs> in the Bible talking about up and down but we won't get distracted by all that but so the the point is who cares that he went up I mean does he just go home you know a lot of people think well he just went home. You know, he left heaven for a while. You'll even hear this sometimes. Preachers he's he's in his this. father's house waiting, and then he'll come yeah, back. Yeah, so it's like he just had a little break from being heaven bound, and he just came down to earth for a bit. Now he's back in heaven. You know, now I have the DC Talk song going. Yes, exactly. My head. That's why you I got me that off way. of audio adrenaline onto DC Talk. That's pretty impressive, Kevin. Because usually right? I'm stuck on the audio adrenaline one when we talk about this. Yeah, DC Talk <laughs> is much better. <laughs> their first album, anyway. <laughs> and that um, is from the first album. There you go. Yes, it is. So. So when we think about the ascension, um, the language we talk about usually is that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So, or seated at the right hand of God, or as the book of Hebrews says, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, right? Lofty okay. terms. Yeah. So so then we get this, I, this question of kind of what does it mean that he's seated at the right hand of God? And um, if you've been listening to us and other people that talk about Jesus correctly, hopefully. Um, <laughs> we, we like to continually go back to the idea that everything Jesus did, he did for our salvation. And everything he does in the two states, both humiliation and exaltation, he does 
in order to save us, in order to, to guarantee us salvation and eternal life. And we talk about, you know, the state of humiliation, the state of exaltation. Ascension obviously is in the state of exaltation. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get to there that in a second. Well, yeah, but, we've had episodes that talk about, okay, when does that happen? Right, when, when, when does that does, happen and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. When so does, that, when that's does been the covered. switch from one to the other? Yep. But what I want to concentrate on is, is we want to continue to see the ascension as part of Jesus's work for our salvation. Yeah. And we don't want to separate the ascension from his identification as our savior. We, we don't as want to the say son of God who saves. The ascension is he's done. Now he's off and he's going to go do something else unrelated to right. that entirely. And then he'll come back to, to Yeah. And then us. he'll kind of, he's kind of taking a break from saving us. Yeah. And he'll come back later. No, we don't want to go down that path. So, so that's kind of what we're going to say in our discussion in this brief podcast, which is getting longer than briefer as we go. But, <laughs> Um, it really does talk about how is the ascension part of Jesus' work as our Savior. Now, we all know that his work is completed on the cross, right? So right. that it is finished, John nineteen thirty, 30, um, and whatever that means, but it, some kind, somehow it's finished, and then that leads directly to the resurrection. And so we know the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his keeping of the law, his incarnation, all that is done. It, it's not going to be done again, right? As we're studying Hebrews in a Bible study we go to together, and um, it once for all, right? Hebrews says that over and over, is that the sacrifice mm-hmm. of Christ is once for all. We're not going to look for another sacrifice. We're not going to re-sacrifice Christ, none of that kind of stuff, once for all. So so when we say the ascension is part of his work to save us, we don't mean that it's any way saying that the work wasn't finished on the cross and the resurrection. So so what it means is that the ascension is part of that work, that what he accomplished on the cross and through the empty tomb continues through the ascension, right? Sure. So it's not it's not a new event, it's kind of the continuation of it. And and that's really an important thing to keep in mind as we talk about the ascension. And this is one of the reasons that Lutherans talk differently about the ascension than other denominations. Okay, how do we talk about it differently? Yeah, so That's, how do we talk about it differently? I'm not, and, I, I haven't thought through that, that we actually talk about it differently, because I don't know if I've heard a lot of other denominations talking about it to notice the difference. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we talk about is that we quickly discuss what does it mean that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and what does it mean when, it, when we say he went up into heaven? The question is, are those places locations? Ah, okay. And if they are, are they created locations? Hmm. Are they physically created locations? And and this is a big deal. It might not sound like a big deal, but it, but it has implications um, when we go down the road here a little bit. And as Lutherans, we say the right hand of God is certainly a place but it's not a physically created place like earth would be. But instead, the real point of the right hand of God is that it's a position of authority and power. So we look at Matthew 28, when right before the ascension, he says to the disciples, all authority in heaven Mm -hmm. on earth has been given to me. And then you look at Revelation 4 and 5, where Jesus reigns as heaven's king. And we think about the enthronement psalms where the you know the the king, Yahweh's king, rules over the whole earth, those kind of movements. And we say, this is what it means for Jesus to be seated at the right hand of God. It's not that he's he's kind of confined to a space that's located not to the left, but to the right of the Father, you know, not that kind of thing <laughs> right um, which which could be that and that'd be fine if you if if Jesus does have a physical location next to the father that's fine too but that's yeah, it's, not its primary referent yeah he, he might actually be located in some way like that but that's not the point yeah and, and that's not actually rehearsed in scripture that way yeah so so we much more want to think of it as a position of power a position of authority um and also then we want to also think about this in terms of the state of exaltation and this is where our confessions really go with it, is that the the ascension of Christ is tied to the ex, the state of exaltation, which we've gone over, but let's just quickly go over it again. Mm-hmm. Jesus operates in two different states, 
right? Right. He operates in the state of humiliation and the state of exaltation. State of humiliation is his voluntary refraint from the full use of his divine nature. He still has it, right? He still has his right. divine nature, but he voluntarily refrains from using it all the time. So from the full use of his divine nature. So we see this in his earthly ministry. That's when you think about the state of humiliation is his earthly ministry. When he's hungry, when he's tired, when he doesn't know certain things, those kind of, that's all state of humiliation where we say he, uh, he was hungry according to his human nature. Mm -hmm. But we also say that that's, that's uh, evidence of the state of humiliation where he, he didn't have to be hungry, right? The divine nature doesn't get hungry, but he voluntarily refrains from the full use of his divine nature and therefore is hungry. Um, okay, that's easy. Yep, yep. The state of exaltation then is obviously the opposite, is that <laughs> this is this is the full use of his divine nature. This is the full divine nature on display of Jesus. While at the same time, his human nature is still now, fully there. Now, Peter, it, it didn't now like Peter, go away. See, see, oh, here, I did it here, again, see, Peter. See, here's the thing, and that's exactly <laughs> right. What you're saying is so important. <laughs> this is this is the Lutheran confession, isn't it? Is yeah. that just as in the state of humiliation, the divine nature didn't disappear? Yeah. So also in the state of exaltation, the human nature remains. Yeah. Okay. okay now so I know where you're going. Still, with others talking about it differently. I have heard this. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so he's still incarnate. Yeah. He's still fully human. Yep. Right? Yep. But now he's fully human with the full exercise of his divine nature. Which is even more brain bending than the, the previous state than of the humiliation other. where it's like, yes. okay, I can totally get he's divine and just not using his power, right. you know, choosing yeah. not to use it. Great. But now this fully human and fully God and fully using his power divine power i that okay nope we're out i don't i yeah. have no idea how oh, to process boy. that <laughs> so so because that's so weird let's let's not take our word for it because we're just two goobs on the internet right <laughs> this is the this is the formula of concord so that's in the book of concord which is our lutheran confessions solid declaration article eight which is on the person of christ honestly just my favorite thing to read in the book of concord um Paragraph 26 says this. On this basis, too, after the resurrection from the dead, the human nature enjoys exaltation over all creatures in heaven and on earth. This is nothing other than that he has laid aside the form of a servant completely without discarding his human nature, which he retains forever, and was installed into the full possession and use of his divine majesty according to his assumed human nature. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, he also possesses majesty from his conception in the womb of his mother, but as the apostle testifies in Philippians 2, he emptied himself of that majesty, and as Dr. Luther explains, he kept it in secret in a state of humiliation and did not use it all the time, but only when he wanted to. So that's <laughs> the formula of Concord saying what we just said, right? Humiliation, he has the divine nature, but he doesn't always use it. Exaltation, he has the human nature, but now he exists in the full glory of the divine nature. Now listen to this. You know what that means? That means Jesus is fully human with all the qualities of God, which means he is physically omnipresent. Ow. Yeah. That hurts again. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and this, so, and this, this physical, because this is the state of exaltation, which as we covered happened at the resurrection, it's like, okay, from that point on, here we go. He's 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 got this and can do this, right? Right. So now listen to this. Keep on going in the former concord. <sighs> See, it says according to the mode of the right hand of God, it is not some specific spot in heaven as a sacramentar sacramentarians propose without basis in the Holy Scripture. Instead, it is nothing other than the almighty power of God which fills heaven and earth. Christ has been installed in this power according to his humanity, right? In fact and in truth without mixing or equating the two natures in their essence or in the eternal char essential characteristics. Now listen to this. This is where it gets important. On the basis of this communicated power, he can be and truly is present with his body and blood in the 
supper. holy supper according to the words of his testament to which he was has directed us through his word. This kind of thing is impossible for any other human being. For no other human being is united in this manner with the divine nature or has been installed in the exercise of divine almighty majesty and power through and in the personal union of the two natures in Christ as Jesus, the son of Mary, has been. In him, the divine and human natures are personally united with each other so that in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. Colossians 2.9, right? Hey, we've covered that. See, this is <laughs> this is what's all this stuff we've been talking about with Christology. I'm telling you, it always boils down to, and this is how God worked to save you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the amazing work of a God who loves you and has done all of this to save you. And now in the ascension, look what we get here. We get this Jesus saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And we go, well, that's great but I don't see the Holy Spirit and I don't always feel the Holy Spirit. And he goes, no, 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 wait, don't forget. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. Listen to my word. Whoever abides in my word, he is truly my disciple right? Mm -hmm. And I will raise him up on the last day. See, and all of a sudden spirit, and you go, wait a minute, spirit. Oh, wait, I remember in John 3 when he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God except by water and the spirit. spirit. Yep. And all of a sudden we say, it is the ascension. It is the ascension of Jesus that makes us remember these promises and gives us faith to believe that the God who is fully human and fully divine and now is at the right hand of the majesty on high, he is the one who comes to us as he said. Hmm. That's the ascension. The, this is one of the wonderful things when, when we pay attention to the liturgy and the church calendar, and, and when it does it well, because some weeks it's kind of weird, but the yeah. Alleluia for this week was John 14... I can't remember the reference, but it was what you just quoted. I will not leave mm -hmm. you. Right. I will not as leave orphans. you as orphans. So That's when you right. said that, I was like, hey, that was actually the Alleluia for this Sunday. That's oh, exactly right. And now we know why. So here we go, because next Sunday is Pentecost, this upcoming Sunday, and that's when the Holy Spirit comes. Look, they haven't been left as orphans. Here is the Holy Spirit coming to them as Jesus promised he would. And it's, it's it might be kind of weird how... People think, why, why are you starting off about talking about Thursday and church on Sunday and all the different calendar stuff? But this is where it actually starts to come together. This is one of those seasons where it actually fits really well as we follow along with the church calendar and scripture. Because well, and the other is, thing, and, and reminding us that the, the whole point is reminding us and pointing us in the right direction. <laughs> right. And the other thing, and I know, I know you heard this on Sunday because I, I, I had a similar experience, is that the the reading for this Sunday which is the, the Sunday between um, Ascension and Pentecost, mm -hmm. is Acts chapter 1, where Peter tries to convince everybody they need a new apostle. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. He's like, hey, guys. let's ca We're going to cast lots. We got these two we guys. Need, we need a new apostle because we're missing one. Right? Yeah. See, and that's always been an interesting... I think you and I have talked about this, but this whole... The, the idea, the, see, this is one of two places I can think of offhand where casting lots seems to be God's will. The first one is Jonah, where well, the other sailors cast lots and they figure out, oh, it's Jonah, he's the bad dude. So you take that and say, apply that to this, and biblically it's like, well, God worked through lots there. This must be God well, working through lots let's, here. Let's not, get, let's not go too far <laughs> with the lots. Let's, let's instead look at this verse. Um, and this is what I want to bring out. The casting lots. But my whole point is I want to justify gambling, Kevin. Yeah, I know. You want to throw dice and pretend that God's working that way. Yeah. Which probably isn't what they did, actually. But that's okay. But listen to this. Remember, this is Peter, who at this moment is actually a faithful believer in Jesus. He's he's kind of gotten over his whole I don't know the man thing. Yep. And he's now been re reinstalled into the office there of the Holy Ministry by Jesus. There was a long conversation on the beach. Right. Yep. And so... 
he believes Jesus that are not going to be left alone as orphans, but they're going to send the Spirit. Now listen to this. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Now, do you, do you see where Peter is looking to find the Holy Spirit? Hmm. He's looking to the word. Yeah. He's looking to the word. And and this is huge for us. It's, is that the apostles themselves knew to look for the Holy Spirit in the word of God. Okay. Before Pentecost, even, the apostles knew from Jesus to look for the Holy Spirit in his word. And we do the same thing. Yeah. We look for God in his word. We say, if I want to know God's promises, if I want to know my sins are forgiven, if I want to know that I'm a sinner in, in God's sight and need repentance, forgiveness, if I want to know what God has done for, to forgive my sins, if I want to know the truth, I look to the place where God promises to be. I look to his word. And what we find out in Ascension is now the word is fulfilled and and Jesus all of his promises have been kept through his death and resurrection and now he reigns as heaven's king he has all authority the one who died for you the one who rose for you the one who will come again as judge has all authority and he will show up i keep saying that the best advertisement for church is you ought to come to my church cuz jesus does <laughs> you know i mean he shows up and, and I actually do believe that. And this is our confession of the ascension, is that because of the, because of the exaltation of Christ, now, and we talked about that, you can go back and review this, in the ga- Gainus Maestaticum, what happens is the human nature receives from the divine nature all of the divine qualities. And does not share them back. Does not share human qualities back to the divine. It's a one-way process. Yep, we the got divine an entire nature episode gives, on that one. That's right. The entire <laughs> episode. And the we said the reason this is so important is because this is the biblical doctrine of the real presence of the Lord's Supper. That mm-hmm. Calvin, Zwingli, and others said, no, Jesus has to be physically located at this physical location of the right hand of God because humans can't be located more than one place at one time. Yeah, they said if the the attributes are going to go one way, they have to go the other way. That's kind of what they did. That's kind of what they did. They kind of said if he's going to be human, (laughs) he's got to be human. And what that means is he's got to be human the way that we define humanity. Yeah. Um, Which is fine, except for you have to understand that Jesus is a unique situation in that he has a divine nature. And yeah. remember, this is where your Christology gets very that's important. That's going to change things. <laughs> it's going to change things. That's right. <laughs> and and the error that most people fall into when they want to start talking about human and divine is they start splitting up Jesus into two Jesuses, right? Yeah. Yep. You have a human Jesus and a divine Jesus. And you say, well, you know, when Jesus is acting like a human, he does this, but when he's acting divine, he does that. And that, and that, as we know from church history, that's Nestorianism. Yeah, that's one um, of the terms Apollinarianism, that's been used. Yep. different ways that people have talked about this. So remember, Nestorius is the guy who kind of thought there were literally two Jesuses you could separate. Um, and, and Apollinarius thought that the soul or the noose, the mind of Jesus was the logos, but the rest of him was some human thing. <laughs> um, and, and there's all kinds of implications of why they said that and what it all means. But but anyway, the point is, is that we we look at scripture and we say, okay, now it talks quite clearly in Paul's writings about Jesus having the fullness of the deity being highly exalted above the heavens, right? Um, we talk about Philippians where he's he's given a name that is above every name and all these things. And we say that this is, this is a description of Jesus in the state of exaltation. So then when he says to the church, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Right. And then Paul comes along and says, Hey, you know that when you're, when you're eating the bread, you're participating in the body of Christ. When you're drinking the cup, you're participating in the blood of Christ. And we go, 
what? And then Paul <laughs> says, now I'm only saying what I received and now I'm passing on to you. And then he quotes Jesus' own words again, Yep. the words of institution. And we say, oh, okay. So, so this giving of the body and blood in the bread and wine of Jesus is not to be taken as a symbol, but somehow to be taken literally. Somehow. And we say, how does that work? Mechanically, how does that work? And now we're back to the brain bending part because you right. got the human and the divine fully on display. It's like, ow. Oh. Yeah. And that's why we, <laughs> whoa, what? And and if it's really funny, we don't have time to do this, but if you, if you then went to the form of Concord on the Lord's Supper, which is right before, that's Article right, 7. Which is right before, yep. which is, yeah, literally right before this one, it spends most of its time talking about the ascension. <laughs> because it's talking about how does this work? And it talks about the ascension. Um, and this is so important because we actually believe. Mm, yeah, it would be fun to read it to you. It's almost too long to read, but it's just it just goes over what we just said. Right. And it's Kemet, and, so it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> and he wrote the book, The Two, Two Natures in Christ. So, you know, he knows what yep. he's talking about. But uh, I, I just love to read it all to you because it's so much fun. But. <laughs> But Which this, translation are you using, Kevin, really quick? Because I couldn't today, follow you. Well, I'm reading... The, the one I read online was the Cole Wengard edition, but that's not a oh. choice. That's just the one that I happen to be That's reading. funny. My, my my microphone is sitting on Cole Wengert, and I had I my have, reader's edition that I was looking from, so I should yeah, have switched those tonight, around. <laughs> earlier tonight, I was using the reader's edition. Um, earlier in the day, I was reading the Tappert edition. And then yesterday, I was reading the Book of Concord dot org edition which is the is that old, Dao? yeah that's the old Dao. so <laughs> i've read four translations of the book of concord in the last 24 hours or so maybe 36 hours and now we know so, why kevin wanted to pick this topic <laughs> yeah and so well yeah i just it's been fun to poke around right yeah yeah um, i've also been preparing for bible studies and stuff so it's been fun but but um really to boil it all down when you think about the ascension of Christ, you think about Jesus in the state of exaltation. He's fully human still, but now his divine nature is full, fully in display. Okay, so you fully see his divine nature. All of his divine qualities are given to his human nature so that he is, he is now fully in the state of exaltation. He is present in the Lord's Supper and he's coming again. And when he comes this time, he will not come in the state of humiliation, but he will continue in the state of exaltation, which means when he comes back, he will not be meek and mild Jesus getting hungry and thirsty and learning and suffering and dying. No, he will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will judge the living and the dead. He'll be on a white horse and he'll have a huge sword coming out of his mouth. It's going to yes. be scary. And, and <laughs> a word of advice you best be on his side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Because he's coming as King of Kings and he suffers no fools. And, and this is, this is not something that we rejoice in for those who will be condemned that we love, but it is something we confess with the church. And it is something we look forward to because this is the culmination of his work. Mm -hmm. as our savior. So we talked about this at the beginning of the episode that the ascension is also part of God's work to save us. And that's exactly what it is, is that in the ascension, your savior reigns as heaven's king, as king of kings and Lord of lords, all authority of heaven and earth has been given to him. The majesty of God, right? The right hand, the majesty of God, the fullness of all things, that's your savior. So mm -hmm. now listen to this. When he says, it goes because he has no competition. So when he's advocating for you before the Father, there's no one to speak against him because he wins. He is victorious over all, over sin, over death, over the power of the devil. Jesus wins. And he gives you that victory. He gives you the forgiveness of sins. He gives you his presence in his word, in baptism. Specifically now, we're going to talk about in the Lord's Supper. Listen very clearly. He is truly present. Hmm. in with under bread wine lutheran's got the best deal going we get when you go to lord's <laughs> supper we get four things right we get bread and body we get blood and wine 
we get all four things because that's exactly what Jesus promises to give to us. And the ascension is when we celebrate the fact that he comes to us as he promises and he sustains us in that until his promised Mm -hmm. second coming. And so we live our lives in the sure and confident hope of the second coming that he will come back and complete our redemption by bringing us to the Father's house, the kingdom that has no end, where there'll be no more sickness, no more dying, no more pain, no more sin, no more sorrow. Now, Kevin, when we started this episode, you talked about wanting to show people how the ascension to, or to teach us to think about the ascension as part of Christ's saving work. And I've been pondering that as, as we've discussed this throughout the episode, because I think it's it's helpful not only for this, but in several other if, events in his life. I, I particularly think of conversations where we see uh, somebody sees a crucifix, and they might be offended by the fact that Jesus is there hanging on a cross. Um, mm-hmm. Or they're simply not familiar with it and they're not used to seeing that. It's it's kind of odd imagery for them. And the, the response tends to be, well, he rose from the dead, so I'd prefer to see an empty cross. Or I think an empty cross is a better confession to make because Jesus rose from the dead. Well, the ascension is, in the same way that we don't jump straight over the crucifixion mm-hmm. so that we have an empty cross to demonstrate the resurrection, we, we don't jump over the ascension. We spend a lot of time on his birth uh, right. uh, as a baby, and yet people don't seem to be bothered by having a baby in a manger when Jesus grew up. And Right. He truly isn't and, in the manger anymore. <laughs> and, and, and none of this should actually bother any of us in, in the sense that all of it was for our salvation. Why did he become a baby? Well, incarnate of the Virgin Mary, so that, you know, or because he was going to suffer and die for our sins and be raised for our sins and as we've talked about ascend into heaven part of that salvation as well and he's going to come back and judge us uh Mm -hmm. i thought of the athanasian creed at the end right according to our works yeah that's that's kind of Uh talking about sin that's a sin thing we're we're back into the salvation and sin kind of discussion so it's we're, we're not highlighting one event over another or necessarily saying that one is better than another we're simply trying to highlight how all of them Mm -hmm. are to accomplish the same purpose. Right. And it's worth celebrating. It's worth remembering. It's worth commemorating all of them, even if it means going to church on a Thursday. (laughs) Well, and and the other thing it's worth, and and I'm glad you brought it up, because I've actually had some conversations about this lately with people, um, about the cruc the crucifix versus the empty cross. Now for for those of you who aren't aware of what what we're talking about Generally, in church art, a crucifix is a cross that has the body of Jesus on it. Okay, mm-hmm. so the corpus of Christ, whatever you want to say. Usually the, um, the dead, dying body of Christ. Yeah, There's also then, versions that have him resurrected, arms out, of, ascending. Right. Or that, head up. Some yeah. have head down versus head up, and that's that's a whole other discussion. And then, obviously, the empty cross is exactly what it sounds like. It's it's a cross without the body of Jesus on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and there's a lot of people who are very like upset the one on the wall behind you right now, or the one. I'm oh no, back. it's not a video. Right. We I can see this because we're yeah, doing a video. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Anyways. And 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 I have very good friends who who take very strong stances on either one of those. And here's what I would say to to all of this stuff, especially you know empty cross versus versus crucifixion or crucifix. Um. They're both accurate. Christ died on a cross, and we should never be ashamed of that. He rose from the dead, and he is not on the cross anymore. That's also true. Neither one of those is mutually exclusive to the other. Mm-hmm. And if you have one that you love, and you have a conversation with somebody about it, explain to them what aspect you're concentrating on, and confess the fullness of the other aspect. You yeah. know, if someone says, oh, it has to be a crucifix, just ask them why. Just ask them, what do, what do you mean? And a lot of them will say, well, I need a Jesus who's present. And I say, me too. Mm-hmm. And and that's one way to represent that. You know, for, I, I also look for Jesus to be present in his word and in his sacraments. And and so if you have to have a crucifix to, to kind of remind you that he really died for you and he's really present, okay, 
but but it's also okay to have an empty cross mm -hmm. and it's and you're not anti-resurrection if you have a, a crucifix a crucifix and you're not you know anti real presence of christ if you have an empty cross it's this is a way for us to witness to our faith to each other to explain what we believe and to help each other think these things through think together the fullness of what christ has done right and in the case of my church uh, the biggest piece of art in the front of my church is actually Jesus ascending right, the ascension. into heaven. Yeah. So <laughs> it's neither. Fun? So yeah. you have you have this discussion of, well, Jesus on the cross or a cross without Jesus. And our congregation is like, well, actually, we're going with the ascended Jesus. Right, going the ascended Jesus. So, I mean, and it's, yeah, but all for the same reason. <laughs> right, right. And it's, you know, um, I've been to your church many times and I'm, I'm friends with your pastor and um, it's, it's such a it's such a blessing to have a way to preach Christ in that way, right? Where you have yeah. the ascension behind you, and and yet there is no ascension without the resurrection, and there's no resurrection without the crucifixion, you know, and there's no crucifixion there's no without crucifixion the perfect life, or the and cradle, there's no, and there's no <laughs> the perfect life without the birth, and you know, and you just keep going on and on and on. You say, well, then why was he incarnate? Well, to lead a leave a perfect life. Why would he lead a perfect life? To to be the perfect sacrifice for sin. Well, how did that happen? I saw on the cross. Well, was that the end? No, he rose from the dead. Well, is that it? No, he ascended into heaven. Right? I mean, you yeah. just keep going, and <laughs> and that's the point is all of this stuff and all the times that we talk about this, and as you go to Bible study and you read things and learn about scripture and read the scriptures themselves it's all so that you can have faith and trust in jesus as your savior and so you can teach someone else yeah. the fullness of god's love for them in christ just think about this the ascension is yet another way to share the fullness of god's love for sinners who don't deserve it but now your savior is heaven's king. He's king of king and lord of lords. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's the crucial conversation. Hopefully through this conversation, you're able to talk to somebody else and have that crucial conversation with them about the ascension, uh, why it's important, why it matters. Um, thanks for joining us today. And I guess next week you'll hear us from several weeks ago. That's and, right. and then after that, there will be another week. And and whatnot but you guys have any questions please email us uh send us messages uh facebook twitter uh instagram crucial productions is on all of those you can find us go to crucialproductions.org and select the ask a question button at the top you can fill out the form and that sends us your questions or send us an email questions at crucialproductions.org we'd love to hear from you we'd love to hear your thoughts on the show your feedback if anything we've said has confused you or inspired you or uh, you want further explanation we we are more than happy to uh yeah field those questions and maybe they'll show up on a podcast episode we've actually done that before <laughs> any final words kevin nope all right thanks for joining us everyone and have Thank a good you. night see ya